everyone. Welcome to Liquid Margins 43, the craft of instructional annotations. A few pieces of housekeeping before we get started. Slide advance, oops, too many. Um, you are here for Liquid Margins. We've got some great uh, episodes from Liquid Margins coming up. We've got some great uh, Liquid Margins adjacent content uh, webinars coming up. We have a, an, a, a webinar on our, on our integration with Vital Source. Very exciting to talk about our case study there and share with you some data from courses that use the Vital Source ebook platform in connection with uh, Hypothesis in the spring. Uh, the Dana Mullins students don't do the reading very often in some, time, in some context, and social annotation can help them do the reading. We'll probably touch on that subject today. Um, we also have a, a webinar co sponsored with JSTOR to talk about that integration. Again, some very interesting uh, data and interactions going on uh, through our integration with the JSTOR library platform. And then uh, later this fall, we haven't set a date yet, we're going to do an episode on regular and substantive interactions, which I'm actually going to circle back to in just a second um, in our conversation. Look for more episodes of Liquid Margins coming up. And let's see here. Um, this Liquid Margins, if you're new to Liquid Margins, is really a pedagogical discussion. It's not a how-to tutorial. So if you're here to sort of chat about strategies and best practices for social annotation in the classroom you're in the right place. If you want more basics about how to get started with Hypothesis, uh, reach out to Education at Hypothesis and we can set you up with a demo or a more sort of Hypothesis 101 webinar to introduce you to the platform. Uh, if you would like to turn on closed captioning, oh, sorry, this is about Q&A. We don't have the chat turned on, um, but we do have a Q&A turned on. So if you have questions for the panelists, feel free to drop a question um, there. We have uh, Christy DeCarolis from our customer success team here uh, helping to answer questions. Um, and we we'll, would love to bring your question into the conversation. And then if you want closed caption, that's also something that you can do yourself uh, in Zoom. So go ahead and press that CC icon and you can get closed caption. All right. So the craft of instructional uh, annotations. Um, we're here to talk about instructional annotations, annotations created by instructors for students. And we have really our superstars of instructional annotations. Some of these folks that are guests today are like, you know, the, the number one instructional annotator from our spring 23 um, semester, we, we did look at some data. And then there's also folks that have just been doing this for a long time, built out a lot of scaffolding as part of their courses, um, long time hypothesis users to share best practices with you. Um, instructional annotations, not every instructor uh, using hypothesis in their courses uh, annotates themselves. Uh, they might just set up an assignment to prompt uh, students uh, in the annotation of a text, but keep quiet in the margins. Um, there's nothing wrong with that approach. There are good pedagogical reasons for stepping back from the conversation sometimes. Uh, but whenever I look at course data and I see a high number of instructional annotations, I get excited um, because there's something important happening there, I think. Um, and it relates to something I've been reading about lately, uh, the U.S. Department of Education's uh, relatively recent guidelines around distance education uh, that they released a couple years ago. And they have a big emphasis in their guidelines on uh, online courses involving, quote, regular and substantive interactions between instructors and students, end quote. Um, that's to determine federal financial aid and, and Title IV funding for, uh, for online institutions offering online uh, distance education courses. But of course, that's good teaching really in any modality, right? Instructors should be, instructors should be interacting with their students. Um, and I think Hypothesis is a very powerful way to create space for regular and substantive interactions between students and ins ins instructors. And instructional annotation is a major type of substantive interaction uh, and a way, major way to establish instructor presence in a course uh, as a guide in the learning journey. Um, instructional annotations can be signposts that an instructor adds to a text ahead of students reading and annotating themselves. They can be specific prompts that instructors seed in a reading for students to respond to in discussion threads. Um, and instructional annotations can be replies to student annotations, answering questions, offering feedback, or simply engaging in dialogue. And I think as the conversation plays out here, you'll see that we have folks that are doing uh, maybe one or the other of those approaches or sometimes both. So without further ado, let me introduce our esteemed panelists, uh, an interdisciplinary group of instructors with a high degree of representation in the state of Massachusetts for some reason today. Um, but we're joined by Lisa Delisio, 
biology professor at Salem State University in Massachusetts. Hi, Lisa. Welcome. Uh, we're joined by Daisy Flame, uh, professor of English at Springfield Technical Community College in Massachusetts, and Marcia Good, um, senior professional lecturer in anthropology uh, at DePaul in Chicago, and Daniel Hutchinson, associate professor of history um, in Belmont, Belmont Abbey College in North Carolina. He also directs the college's digital humanities program. So this is a relatively informal conversation, but we have some frameworks. Um, well, there you guys are. There's everybody. Hi. <laughs> um, uh, so we'll just make this as much of an open conversation. I kind of just want to start about hearing about uh, where you teach and the context. I think understanding a little bit of the context of where an educator is coming from is important. So maybe you can tell us just a little bit about the school you teach at and the types of courses. Uh, and maybe we'll start with you at the top of my screen, uh, Marcia. Hi, everyone. It's a real privilege to be here today, and I'm so excited to hear from the other panelists as well. I teach at DePaul University, which is the largest private Catholic research institution, um, university. We have, uh, let's see, one in three people are first generation that come to us and we have a broad diversity of students. And I think that's something I wanted to put up front because it's so important to hear from a multiple points of view on a, a piece of reading. So that's one of the main reasons I use it. And it's one of the main reasons I kind of begged Paul several times to work there and finally got finally got in in 2008 because I really appreciate that kind of diversity in an urban context. And uh, Marcia, uh, anthropology? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, I teach anthropology and I did make a little, I te teach a lot of survey classes like um, cultural and medical anthropology. And then I teach more classes around women's health and also indigenous studies that are part of my raise, being raised in Mexico. So I have women's health in the global south, anthropology of childbirth, Maya humanities, et cetera. And this coming year, I'll teach a course in the race, power, and resistance called birth justice. Wow, I, I want to take these courses. Uh, we'll go Daniel and then Daisy and then Lisa. Uh, thanks, Jeremy, and thanks to the Hypothesis team for putting this together. And uh, thanks all of y'all for being here today to learn more about social annotation. Um, I teach at Belmont Abbey College, a small liberal arts college established by uh, Benedictine monks. It's a Catholic college like uh, DePaul in Chicago. Um, we, as a small liberal arts college, we focus on building a sense of community and trying to really embody uh, mentorship and, and close work with our students and helping to shape and form them in their educational journey. And the courses that I teach at Belmont Abbey College, um, I teach in the history department. And so I primarily use hypothesis for my intro level history courses, as well as upper level history courses. Uh, we rely a lot upon a lot of close reading of historical texts and documents. And I found hypothesis really helpful for breaking down context and helping students get an informed and collectively examined take on a particular historic uh, text. I also teach courses in digital humanities where we learn about new methods and technologies for exploring the human condition um, using some of the uh, cutting edge technologies of today. And hypothesis is really helpful in helping students uh, break down, critically analyze, and use these technologies um, to empower them in their learning journeys. So that's a little bit about where I teach and the type of teaching that I do. I'm Daisy Flame, and I teach at Springfield Technical Community College, or STCC. Um, we're not supposed to use stick, but you might hear me use it. Um, so, uh, our community college is, um, it's just a really important place for students who've been historically underserved by education. Um, lots of students from marginalized groups, so many first generation college students. So I always think of us as being everyone's first chance or their last chance a little bit. Um, in terms of the workload, um, I, I teach English and I do get some upper level lits or creative writing or women's studies, but um, the bread and butter at a community college is definitely 
comp one, what we call comp one and comp two, the first two writing courses. The first one is straight up writing. And the second one is writing um, an introduction to literature, depending on the professor. I do it as introduction to literature with writing. Oh, and I'm happy to be here today. Thanks everybody. <laughs> I think it's my turn, yes. Um, okay, so hi everybody. So excited to be here with all of you um, and share my experience using Hypothesis. Um, I, my name is Lisa Delisio. I'm a professor of biology at Salem State University in Salem, Massachusetts. We're a primarily undergraduate institution with some graduate programs. Um, and we, um, in the state university system um, in Massachusetts, not UMass and not the community colleges, but the, you know, the level in between, um, we're, uh, we've got the most diverse student body, um, including lots of first generation students. And we're working toward um, becoming a Hispanic serving institution as well. Um, so I'm a biology professor who looks at larger scale biology. So not cell and molecular stuff, but, um, uh, organism up to ecosystem and um, biosphere. So I teach uh, ecology and the environment. I teach environmental problems. I teach conservation biology. And those are the courses that for which I used hypothesis in the spring. And that was the first time I used it. Um, but I expect to be using it again um, in fall with a botany course as well as a um, honors uh, botany oriented course. Um, so yeah, I'm excited to be here. Quite a, quite a range of biology from plants to the atmosphere. <laughs> <I'm impressed. laughs> um, yeah, I'm a, I'm a conservation biologist and a plant ecologist. So it's, um, it, yes, there's a lot. <laughs> um, well, I wanted to start off the conversation uh, just hearing about what drew you to social annotation as a technology. Maybe we'll go in the same order we just did, starting with Marcia. Uh, What's your read of social annotation? Why are you social annotation in your teaching at, um, at DePaul? One of the things that as a, a teaching, and when you teach in survey courses, uh, you have a, our classes are capped at 45, but it's still a challenge to learn to know people like on, in an online setting and to give students a kind of one-on-one -on -one attention and to see them that students that come to DePaul expect. Uh, I, I had started with some of the challenges and that was the challenge, but I really, I really got into this. I was using, I used Instagram and I used Facebook back in the day until I felt like it was too poisonous for people to come in through the Facebook portal and Instagram changed all its, uh, changed all its algorithms and, you know, we couldn't be a little community anymore. So Primarily, this is about building learning community and also addressing the different ways that students read now. I've been teaching for 20 years and students do not read the way I read in grad school and I don't read the way I read in grad school. Our brain synapses just work very differently. And to be able to engage with a text and to be able to create on the margins, sort of that illustration that draws people's eyes down through the meaning of the text. Uh, I put a lot of emphasis on them adding color and illustration as well as their ideas, because I, it just makes reading more engaged and more fun. And uh, like one student said, they don't feel as lonely when they're reading. Um, you know, when you're sitting there trying to get through 15 pages for a class and you're just, you're all by yourself and some people turn on TV in order to be able to read it or have music in the background. But honestly, being part of an engaged uh, learning community. Also, I, I wanted them to see each other. Uh, too often, the good students are always going to be great students. They're always going to meet the basics of anything you give them. But other students don't get to see them. In, uh, and this is one, one student said last year, they said, I had no idea people in this class knew so much. And I think that, you know, we talk a lot about decentering, uh, not the sage on the stage kind of idea, but, you know, we're making buffets of learning for students. And we're putting lots of material out there that they can use from a, from a lot of different perspectives and bring who they are into reading. And those are, those are, those are my primary reasons. There's lots of reasons. 
Yeah, that's a lot. That's a lot of reasons right there. I feel like you might have stole everybody's thunder. That's a be beautiful articulation of a lot of the value uh, that I see in hypothesis. But uh, Daniel, do you want to add anything to that or emphasize anything that Marcia mentioned? Absolutely. Um, I, I would certainly piggyback on that desire to create a sense of community among students and in, in this intellectual exploration of a particular topic. In my classes, we often will take a historic text and try to break it down. And uh, these texts sometimes can be familiar to students, but oftentimes they ask students to approach history um, and historic language in ways that may not be familiar to them or, or may not be something that they're used to engaging. And so particularly before, I guess, 2020, we would do the, a lot of that in class. So we would do a lot of in-class discussion, um, reviewing of the text and the material, but then, then came COVID. And suddenly all of my standard playbook just completely went out the window. And I was really desperate to find some way to recreate that sense of dialogue and conversation and community. An hypothesis saved my bacon. Uh, our, <laughs> instit our institution um, connected with hypothesis, and I began utilizing it in my courses. And while um, well, there certainly was a transition to be made there, it really was helpful in fostering dialogue and conversation at a moment when it was sometimes difficult to get students to share, to talk, to um, uh, to put their perspective forward. And the ease by which hypothesis allowed students to express themselves, to communicate with each other, to, um, to and to really dig into the text made me, um, it, it really made it a rewarding learning experience, both for me as an instructor, and I think as well for my students. And now it's become a, a primary toolkit in, in the way I use to teach historic texts. Daisy? Yeah, um, so I came for a very simple reason. I used to, uh, I always require, when I first started teaching literature, I was stunned by how disengaged people seemed. And then I had them annotate what we were doing because where I, when I went to school, every English major ran around with a pen in their hand, you know, in a book. You couldn't read a book without a pen. And so I had them annotate and saw everything get so much better. The discussions were so much richer. Um, and then, um, and I, I used to grade it because my thing is, if you don't grade it, they won't do it. So I graded it. And so all I was looking for is some way to grade their annotations. So I came for that, but stayed when I realized that I could switch to entirely online texts that were free. So that's awesome for our students who, you know, are poverty's huge at our college. And, um, and then I realized um, that I could seed the texts. I think uh, Jeremy mentioned seeding the texts with definitions, prompts, all that kind of stuff. And then my final and most happy realization is something that Daniel and Marcia touched on is that we could be a community again in a way that discussion boards just couldn't at all. And um, I always say that when we're in the classroom and we're discussing a text that we're sharpening our fine minds against each other's. Mm. And I feel <laughs> like we can do that again. You know, and of course, in English, I don't want to make a, well, I'm making a special plea for English, but we carry very much like this word, these three words, how do they change everything? And so uh, hypothesis is especially suited, you know, for that. So I've, I'm, I've really been grateful. That's a great segue, too, for our token scientists in the room, uh, right? Everybody else on this, I mean, I guess anthropology, maybe you're, you know, you know, straddling both, uh, but, uh, you know, Lisa, you are the scientist, you're the, the, the biologist. Like, uh, I think a lot of people are familiar with close reading as an important part of the English curriculum and for primary texts, you know, in, as Daniel mentioned in, in history, but why is social, why, why were you attracted to social annotation for, for teaching of biology? Well, um, we do have texts that they need to read that are denser and denser every year. I mean, they, the biology texts have become encyclopedic even within narrower disciplines within biology. Um, and so I, I try to find readable texts, but it's not easy. Um, and I have had students do three to one assignments and Canvas, Canvas discussions, um, but uh, I would say that AI pushed me over the edge. Uh, it became very clear to me right away, like I'd say over Thanksgiving, <laughs> uh, that um, that 
it was going to be way too easy uh, for my students to ask an AI to uh, to create their discussion board submissions. <laughs> um so uh and i was really happy to connect with the institutional uh sorry the um instructional designers at my institution who uh alerted me to the existence of hypothesis i hadn't known about it before then and so this replaced that assignment in my class and it's much better um so in all of my classes they are annotating the text and i'm responding to what they're writing it's it, Close reading is important in biology as, as well um, as, as other disciplines and precision in language when the students write is so important. Um, so uh, it gives me a chance to give them feedback in a, a supportive way, in a community way that um, furthers the conversation with their classmates. And I, I really appreciate that opportunity. Um, I've also used it to <laughs> have students, especially my non-majors, link uh, the text to their major. So they have to include a source and talk about the relationship between what they're reading in environmental problems and criminal justice or um, nursing, right? Um, and I've had students who told me that they didn't think at the beginning of the course, they thought there would be nothing that connected between, there was no connection between their major and environmental problems. Um, of course, there's a connection between every major and environmental problems. Right. Um, and I also had students tell me that it was the first time they really thought, had to think in a class when they're forced to make those connections in the annotations. So uh, I was really pleased with that. That's a neat assignment. Um, maybe we'll go in reverse order this time and keep going with you, Lisa, since, we, uh, since you touched on this a little bit. I'd like to now dive into this idea of instructional annotation and hear how you yourself um, annotate uh, for or with your students. And I haven't gotten the phrasing down, but there's, I, I think there's gonna be a little bit of a division between the, the repliers, people who spend a lot of time replying to student annotations, and I guess the, I don't know what I'm gonna call the other group, <laughs> uh, the seeders, <laughs> maybe we talk about seeding annotations, um, but there, those are different approaches. I think some of you guys do both, but. Starting with Lisa, just tell us a little bit about your, you know, how you approach instructional annotation, how you're annotating with hypothesis yourself for your students. Um, I'm mainly following their lead and responding to their annotations. Uh, so if there's some, if there's a student who's asked a question that hasn't been, uh, that hasn't been addressed yet by another student, I'll ask the other students to chime in, um, ask them to come back and take a look and see whose questions I've highlighted. Um, I've also given uh, my own links, so drawn connections, or ask students to reconsider what they've written in a different, with a different framework. Um, and I think that that's very helpful because there's so much uh, misinformation out there, uh, especially around climate change uh, and other environmental problems that I find that that's really helpful. Um, for my upper level students, I'm able to connect them with resources that will deepen their understanding um, and in the areas where they're curious, right? I wanna follow their curiosity. There's so much to learn. I honestly don't care for the most part um, what they learn and what they don't learn as long as they're learning. Um, so if, if I can help them on their own individual journeys through the annotations, I think that's really helpful. Oh, I think you're muted. So replying, but really nurturing lines of inquiry, helping students down that you know uh, independent line of uh, of thinking. That's that's wonderful. Daisy, do I remember correctly that uh, you're a pre annotator, right? You you like I'm to both. seed or I'm both. You're both. Okay. I, our right. students need a lot of scaffolding, lots. Okay. And so I deal with definitions and context um, all the time. Um, the reading typically they don't come in with really strong reading skills and they typically don't and the vocabulary associated with it you know or just the, the educational capital that a lot of us had growing up I didn't particularly um and so I really identify with that um that cultural capital that's often missing um I can sort of reply and so I think that 
we're going to talk, I think, in a minute about how it works for students, but I think that's one thing that really does work for my students is they have, I can't do that for them when they go home and read a text, a written text, but I can do that as they're reading here so they can feel sort of mastery as they go. And then I'm a total text replier too. Um, so I have them go in twice, once with one half their annotations and once with their second half, because otherwise it's drop and run. I, I made you read everything, everyone's annotations so that you know what's going on, but you drop your annotations and you go. You haven't seen how things progressed or mm -hmm. how I suggested, well, you know, there's a different approach that's possible here, or have you seen this evidence? And um, so when I am annotating, I'm also doing, it's trying to do it as a model for other students. And I do a lot about how to care, how to uh, cordially uh, uh, make uh, suggestions to other people. Um, and so I do it as a model too, so that they can say, oh, I was wondering since you took that position, but I was wondering what support, like if you saw this piece of evidence. And so then that's the ultimate for me, isn't me interacting with them, although I love it. It's that they will do it for each other. Um, mm -hmm. that's a whole different, you know, level, which is very exciting, you know, like for all of us. So. And do you find it, it does nurture that discursive yeah. kind of Yeah, culture? it really does. I'll be honest and say I miss the classroom. But um, it is, it's, I've seen really, really exciting things. And I've seen people really, really change from like pat answers to really having dug in, connected to it personally, connecting to it culturally, asking hard questions. I've really seen so many students transform in the course of a semester. Amazing. Daniel, you're a scaffolder. Do I remember? Uh, that's right. Um, I do try to do um, implement scaffolding in terms of my annotations, both within the annotation, both within a single assignment and then over the course of the semester to try to build on specific type of um, skills, uh, literacy abilities, analytical approaches. Um, the idea is to sort of help work week by week to address a particular his historical ability based upon a particular type of historic text that, that we'll use. I'll typically seed the assignment first with a set of maybe guiding questions to help stimulate uh, students on what they should be looking for in the text or sort of questions or approaches they should take. And then like Lisa and Daisy, through the text, I'll then um, provide contextual explanations of what's going on in the text, definitions of perhaps uh, concepts or, or terms that may be unfamiliar. And I do try to get back in and offer replies to students as they're making their, their annotations. That can be challenging for me personally, I'll admit, but I do, that there's tremendous value in that. And the best value I've seen in terms of that approach is with something I start every semester off with, and that's annotating the syllabus. That's an, an assignment um, I use to both introduce students to hypothesis, how it works. And it's remarkable when you ask students, what questions do you have? When you ask that in class, students are often sometimes hesitant, especially on the first day of class, to actually ask questions about the, the nuts and bolts of the course. But through hypothesis, students will ask really good questions, not just sort of practical questions about the nuts and bolts of what to expect of the course, but even more sort of dynamic questions about uh, the ideas and the subject and the, the direction the course will take itself. And, and from the very beginning, through that sort of approach, you can begin to create dialogue and maybe even create a sense of community too. But yeah, the, the, the goal for, for my efforts in hypothesis is to um, provide some variation, provide an opportunity to build skills and um, try to foster dialogue and conversation. And Daniel, are some of your uh, pre-populated annotations like essentially discussion prompts for threaded discussion, or are they pointing to other parts of the text for students to annotate themselves? Or um, they're often, um, and especially for sort of the first annotation I set, sort of a, a set of a roadmap for how to approach the document and some mm -hmm. ideas and things to keep in mind. And then through the document, I will for specific points of uh, if there's a specific aspect of the document I really want them to, to key in on, 
then I'll sort of seed that with a, another question or um, a, a prompt for dialogue and engagement. Got it. Marcia. Hi. <laughs> I do it differently. Um, and that is, that's a, I guess that's a good thing. I really respect how much you all respond to students. In my cases, I go over the 5,000 in one quarter because uh, I have all these students working on two in, in medical anthropology because I use it differently in different courses. But say in medical anthropology, I have two chapters a week and they're annotating those chapters. I seed it ahead of time. There's always the instructions are always at the exact same place. Um, the instructions are always the exact same thing in terms of this is what you must do to get your grade. You have to have you have to annotate four times, you have to reply four times, and then you have to write sort of a back off big picture answer the prompt in the page note. And you must use uh, either images, uh, hyperlinks, websites, uh, memes in in a, in a few of those. So they know every single time they walk in that that is what they uh, are expected to do. And one of the things I tell them is I'm not judging you on what you say. You should feel very free to have a broad diversity of opinions and not see, you know, not try to cater to what you think a medical anthropologist wants you to say on this. Um, so that is why it's very specific what you need to do for your grade and the rest is all yours. And the four replies, actually I have found students really kind of amazing at calling each other out on misinformation, uh, which always makes me really happy because I have not been able to do the pass through twice. My respects, Daisy, honestly, my respects, because when they go through once, they don't want to come back. And that means they aren't necessarily seeing the replies. The people that get the richest experience are sort of at the end of that curve. And but so I had structured, scaffolded it so that they would come in twice. But then so many people didn't do it. And I was doing all this grading two times, four times a week and just going out of my mind. So now I just in the page notes, um, that's where I really see what people came back from. The scaffolded part of it is that as we go, I'm saying this you will need for your term project. They do an ethnographic interview of somebody with a disease, uh, chronic disease. Make sure you're noticing biosocialities, for example. And then when they're doing their interview, they're asked, what are the four theoretical approaches that you are taking from the text? So as we're going through, there's a lot of discussion on how does this apply to actual people that you might talk to. But yes, um, I'm less of a respond in the moment, um, back off and use it in another part of the course. But I have found that the grading load is heavy enough the way I have it structured that I can't handle going through twice. And I still think it's, there are a couple times when somebody has said something or that I think is just odd. I'll, I'll write to them in the grade book when I'm making the comments. Uh, I open the grade book on the side and I'll comment to them. Oh, by the way, you know, when you annotate it on X paragraph, you really should know about this. But that's personal to them. Uh, I also found that when I jumped in enthusiastically and started replying to people, they kind of backed off and got polite. In mm. other words, the professor is saying the ultimate thing. And when I'm not in there, there just seems to be a richer dialogue. At least I have felt I have felt that in some some of those settings. But that's all kind of open ended. I use it very differently in different classes. I'm speaking how I use it in a large survey course, not large, 45 people is not large. But in a survey course, uh, rather than how I'm using it when I'm asking them to annotate it before coming to class, which is a very different, you know, they're going through and I'll say things like, um, put up a video, childbirth, okay, put up a video of what you learned from TV on how uh, childbirth works and tell us why you chose this piece. Then I open it up in the classroom and we can play some of them and students say, well, I put that up because of this. And it really makes a very rich discussion. It's like, it's what you have in front of the classroom for everybody to look at and see, see what each other did and brought to it. And Marcia, oh, so go ahead, Daisy, please. No, go ahead. 
No, I, I really want you to go. <laughs> okay, sorry. About that. Um, so I saw two things coming up in the chat that were relevant in something Marcia said. Um, so I don't grade twice. I'm not that much of a hero. Um, but uh, when I do grade, I check that they did their first four, like can see the dates. And so I check that they did their first four and their second four on the dates and that they were done on different days. Mm -hmm. And I did see, is it okay if I mentioned two things that came in in the questions? Yeah, great. Okay, so... Um, uh, uh, my Mahatma Noor mentioned that um, it's a, considered a discussion killer to jump in on a thread, so you got to wait as long as possible. I find that there's a way to do it in hypothesis that really works. So if I say student A and student B had a great argument that they were pursuing here, but I think there's um, a good counter argument to be made, and it has to do with this character. Can anybody help us out? You know, or when a student has made a point that's good, but other students don't seem to have picked up on, I could say, can anybody think of an original way to support this point? Because mm. there's more out there. So I think it's totally, I understand the point, but I think it's also possible to do. And somebody mentioned, how do you grade? So as an English professor, grading is the bane of my existence. And it's still true here. <laughs> but um I, they were talking about subject and subjective and, and objective. So I start with the um, objective. Did you do as many as you're supposed to do? And did you roughly follow the instructions? So let's say based on that, you got a seven, right? But you made really original comments. I might bump it up from the seven or figure seven was what you maxed out at, right? And then if someone, it's clearly just repeating other students, you know, then they would drop from their seven to whatever it is. So um, I'm real clear about the like, here's what you need, your bread and butter. And then I want to I want to see your sophisticated, most involved self here. And so I, I love it. I want to dig in a little bit to this uh, to this idea um, and talk about best practices for annotating, because, you know, we've taught somebody mentioned the sage on the stage model. And certainly there are times when when the teacher speaks, you know, in certain contexts. Um, the, the conversation stops, right? Um, and you haven't moved away from the stage on the stage model. And so I'm curious about how people would think about this question. You know, Daisy, you sort of started pointing, I guess, one best practice is not replying with answers, but replying with questions or, you know, trying to keep the conversation going. Do others have thoughts about that? And whether you're seeding annotations or replying, just the proper tone, the proper, or well, not proper, but the, uh, you know, good approaches to keeping the conversation going. Because I think all of us want the students to annotate too, and for our remarks to be the beginning or the middle of something and not the end of it, right? Um, Lisa, go ahead. So I find one way to help give the students some um, confidence in their writing is to draw on their expertise immediately. So having them connect to their major and non-majors classes. If they're in conservation biology, they're each assigned an endangered species. So I encourage them to draw connections to their endangered species as we read through the conservation biology text. Um, uh, or <clears throat> also for non-majors, have them make connections between the topic and their hometown. So then if I chime in, it's because I'm learning something from them, right? <laughs> or suggesting that, um, that they have made a point that was also made about a neighboring town. Um, so did they realize that their classmates are seeing exactly the same thing? This is a pattern. Can we see a pattern arising in the comments? In the, you know, so that's you know, I, drawing those connections and recognizing them as experts. And I think this idea of expertise is going to be more and more important coming back to my topic of AI. Because the only way you can tell if something's bullshit, excuse my language, it's, it's a technical academic term, yes, um, is, is to have the expertise to be able to, to discern that, right? So I think draw, drawing on their expertise and helping them build expertise quickly is, is really important for these discussions, so yeah. I love that. Daniel, anything to add about how you couch your annotations to encourage, you know, the dialogue? One way I, I try to explain hypothesis to students is akin to a, a writing medium in which they do have comfort and they do use a lot, and that's social media. I, I try to tell them, look, if you can write an Instagram post, if you can um, 
communicate with your friends in this meeting. You can do the same thing through with a hypothesis. And I really emphasize to the students that um, sort of as, as Lisa mentioned here, I, I want to hear what you have to say. I want your reflections, your experience to inform the class about your perspective about this text. Um, for example, in, in one of my sort of uh, intro world history courses, students read the Code of Hammurabi, this long list of rather intense laws about justice in ancient Mesopotamia. And I ask the students to, um, from their framework, from their perspective, identify laws that they think are too extreme or in the right place. Like, in, how do these issues that people dealt with 5,000 years before, uh, before the birth of Christ, how does that um, show up in our world today? And by making those sort of contemporary connections to allow them to speak to their expertise, to their, to their worldview, they don't feel like they're going to get an answer wrong, right? They, they certainly can share a perspective that we can offer some guidance on or maybe enrich or enlarge, but getting them to talk, getting them to share their worldview is maybe the first step in getting them then to explore a different worldview and a different way of thinking, which is primarily what the, the job of a historian is all about. So I think creating an atmosphere where they feel free to talk in a, in a space where they can share their framework, their experiences, I think it's a great way to um, help make the world of social annotation a bit more engaging for students. I love it. Just checking to see if anybody unmutes. Go ahead, Marcia. I agree. And I, especially when we're talking about personalizing and applying the kind of things that we're reading. I think that's what's one of the richest things about this. They're not like picking out, not defining terms or anything like that, unless they, everybody's like, hey, hey, you really need this term. This is an awesome term. And I have seeded it ahead of time with some of those. But I'm thinking of one where we were, we were just studying how much people travel for medical care. And the people in the class it was stunning how many people had traveled for surgery, for dental care, going back to Mexico for this, going to <laughs> different parts of the world, go <laughs> for plastic surgery, et cetera, or their parents or, you know, travel or people coming to United States. And that one, it's not really that I can jump in, but it's a, they end up with such a rich uh how the how the text has worked in their own lives and from so many different perspectives. That's what I find really stunning about it. That's great. Uh, there's been a couple questions about grading, so I want to circle back here. Daisy responded a little bit, but um, Marci Marcia uh, uh, and Daniel and, and Lisa, um, do you guys grade student annotations and do you have the tips or tricks for the audience? I do grade and I make it easy on myself by having a spreadsheet where I'm counting. Uh, the basic is just the counting. You did your four, your four and your page note. Um, and then the having it open, having the grade book open on the other side, because unfortunately still the number will go through, but you cannot comment in hypothesis. And that's one drawback. I can't make little comments like, oh, you lost you know, so many points or this page note really didn't have anything to do with the prompt that was asked, you know. And so those kind of comments, I have to have the grade book open on the side. Um, it's not near as I always dread it because I dislike putting numerical things on people's learning like you wouldn't believe. And I think probably everybody in this room shares that feeling. Uh, but it's one of those contract things that we're bound to. But being able to comment in the grade book as I go, having it open on the side when it's needed. Uh, I do do two of these a week, which means I'm grading 90 of them. And that's one class and I have three. So yes, it is. I don't like to say it's not a grading burden. Also, um, the whole thing of notifications, somebody said, do you see notifications when I've, I've heard from hypothesis team members are working on that, uh, that would be great for people to see. Um, put enough weight on the grading of these that it matters to them. Also, 
people see right away who are the ones that are just kind of riding along and not adding much material. And I figure some of those students know how to get their Bs no matter what classes they're in. It's like the students in the elevator saying, uh, I didn't read it. I still got 80% on the quiz. They can't do that in a hypothesis and everybody sees what that is made up of. So those are just a few comments I'd make about grading. There's lots of other things to say. I just want to make a quick note before we hear from Dan Daniel and Lisa on grading that I do have a product backlog card for feedback inputs with D2L and Blackboard. Those of you on the call that are using Canvas, you already have, you know, you can enter uh, private responses to student annotation sets in Canvas SpeedGrader, but we do want to bring that to other LMSs and uh, your snippet there, uh, uh, Marcia, will go to um, go into that ticket on if I can get a recording of it to explain why that's so important. And it's very important for uh, regular and substantive interaction as well, because it's that private feedback on the on the coursework. Uh, Daniel, Lisa, thoughts about grading? Um, so my approach to grading for, for these hypothesis assignments and sort of the scaffold of nature of things, one of the end goals of, of the semester is to compose a paper utilizing a range of primary sources. So students in writing that paper need to learn some specific writing techniques to effectively um, put that together. And so my goal for each hypothesis assignment is to be for it to be fairly low stakes in terms of their overall grade. But I do grade for grammar and composition, and I am looking for a particular word count and ideally um, some evidence of engagement with classmates. And that can come in a variety of ways, depending on if it's an intro level survey or an upper level um, course. I, I vary that depending on sort of the uh, the course difficulty and, and the course nature, but um, it, it, I do set a, a word count and I do sometimes set a number of replies I expect um, from students. There's a challenge with that because then students are just looking to meet that, that word count and then hit those replies and then they don't engage anymore. Um, but I do, I do seek to grade and provide feedback for this in order to give students that, that experience to come to that summative assessment and be able to um, put that together. And hypothesis is a really vital tool for helping me to do that. The grading can um, be substantial in that regard. Uh, I usually do one hypothesis assignment per class per week. I teach between four and six sections a semester. So um, it can be, it can add up, but I find the, the time um, a good investment. We're working on making it easier, including uh, I also have a card, uh, Rochelle uh, Haroldson in the in the Q and A asked about automatic grading. We don't have automatic grading right now. It's you know manual grading of student annotation sets, which I think you know personally, again from the perspective of an English professor uh, like like Daisy, you know I really want to see what the students are doing. Um, but uh, we do have auto grading and different exploring the idea of auto grading is something that we're exploring from a product standpoint, at least in terms of being able to tally you know, three annotations were required, three annotations were, you know, help with the objective part, as Daisy mentioned. Uh, Lisa, any um, thoughts about grading? Yeah, I think it's similar. I'm looking at that count. I think it's something that would show the tally would be fantastic. Um, and also, I'm also looking at whether they've included the link. Um, you know, they usually have to have a link um, to show a connection to something else. Um, so, but whether it's their major or their, uh, in some cases, their hometown, depending on the assignment. So, or, or their endangered species. So uh, that's really what I'm looking for, but I'm also looking for at least one comment that's thoughtful. <laughs> um, and usually it's the comment with the link that's thoughtful. Um, I don't grade for, um, for anything, you know, in terms of their quality of their writing. Um, I just don't have time for that. And that's not what my course is about. Um, although it's really important. If they say something that's totally unintelligible, they don't get points. <laughs> it has to be understood, something that can be understood by me and their classmates. Um, I, I find that they don't tend to skimp a lot on these assignments. I do them, I think usually every other week, right? So, and then I'll have a different alternating assignment on the other weeks. Um, and I can do that if I put enough chapters in one week, you know, <laughs> um, it reduces my grading if I have fewer assignments. So, 
um, but still a lot of writing. I'm gonna fold my final uh, framing device here, which is what advice would you give to uh, folks that are starting with instructional annotation? But I did just wanna highlight two questions that relate to this. Um, we touched on this stuff a little bit, um, but there's a question about, you know, replying too soon or replying and, and kind of killing the conversation. So for those of you that are repliers, maybe you can offer some tips there. And then Eric asks about what are some, you know, reliable and engaging ways to seed annotations. So let's just finish with tips for our guests, for our, for our audience here in terms of um, best practices for instructional annotation. And let's start with Daisy. So I think I, um, I I included a lot of what I wanted to say. There's just one more idea that I think is important, and that's uh, providing them with a short, a sample annotated text. So even if it's in one page, right, you can you annotate it yourself as though you were the students, and then they can see, oh, this is the model. This is what is expected. Um, and some people are talking about word length, and I often too much word length is often people just spitting out almost random words to get page count, you know? Um, and so I want them to see that a really sort of mordant sentence can get more of the heart of things than something really long. So I don't include word count in mine, um, but that, that, that document helps me show them what kinds of com comments will be valued. Great, model annotation uh, uh, assignment, I love that. Uh, Lisa and Daniel and then Marcia. Um, I don't seed anything. Um, I'm not sure I have a lot to add because as I said, I'm trying to draw connections for the students between uh, be between each other. To, so I'm really emphasizing, did you see, you know, Tanya wrote this and that relates to what you wrote. Um, or if they're responding to each other, I really like to encourage that conversation and, uh, recognize that they really are having a deep conversation. Yeah. So I, I think that's that's really my approach. So you're there, but you're really pointing to to them to kind of further their conversation. I like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, in, in terms of for my approach, when I think of a particular article or document I want students to read, I, I really want to think as well about what sort of conversation do I want to spark? What, what are the main threads or issues that I think um, students can get out of this experience? And then with that in mind, I really try to um, it, it, you know, seed the document with questions and with um, prompts that will hopefully uh, propel students towards those, those ends I'd like them to, to get to. But often the most fruitful dynamics in a conversation, of course, when students take it over themselves and lead it in the direction where they want to take it in. And then that's a good moment for me to take a step back and watch the conversation unfold and, and let the students then sort of um, dominate the conversation. And that that is a great approach, I think, to decentering uh, the instructor from from, from the, the, the business of education and getting students to buy into ownership of their own educational journeys. So, um, I, this is not particularly helpful, I guess, but I think you really have to start with each particular assignment you want to use. What's the end goal you want to get out of it? What sort of conversations do you want to spark? And how do you get students to get there? I think that's great. Backwards design. I also find Our, that in terms of what, I'm sorry, <laughs> in terms ahead. of what kind, how we get uh, started with it, and that also addressing the what kind of things do we seed with? Uh, I do find seeding uh, the more complicated vocabulary uh, ahead of time, and I always call it terms and concepts. And so I tag it with the same thing. They could just go through with the tag and see some of the the vocabulary that they're not used to. But they're I always say learning a discipline is learning how to speak with the words that we use. So that kind of seeding I will do ahead of time. And also questions that really, like Daniel was saying, speak to their lives. And Lisa, you know, all of how does this person, what does it personally mean to you in your generation? Let's say the text was written five years ago. What does it mean after the pandemic? And how is this, is this still true? You know, 
So those kinds of things. But in terms of getting started, my biggest advice is expect a lot of work in the first week. Uh, I'm, I'm always surprised how few people at my own institution are using this. I think it's growing, but students come in pretty unfamiliar with it. Um, I have a question, how many of you used it before? And then I kind of have a fun document for them to play with. Some people have suggested the syllabus, you know, other kinds of play with the class roster that didn't work because the roster changed. Uh, but also make a little video of how to actually do the things because I instructional text just isn't working the way it used to. They have to see it. And I've kind of been begging hypothesis for that as well. And it's just where does my mouse go and how does it go in here? It's incredibly simple. And I always tell them this is going to be second nature to you after the first time you do it. Uh, but Having that assignment in the first week, and I use the intro to our textbook for it, you know, what, what do you look forward to in this text? And I also, in that one, I explain each of the chapters and the main learnings that we're going to do and what are they excited about. So I do think putting in work, a lot of front work at the very beginning is important. I have other stuff, but I think we've covered a lot of them. Well, I appreciate y'all. I'm going to um, finish with some housekeeping and then give you a big thank you uh, since we're coming up on the hour here. Um, if you are in the audience and your institution is not yet a Hypothesis customer, you don't have access to Hypothesis in your learning management system as our guests do, please reach out to Education at Hypothesis. I know the fall is approaching. Sorry to remind the, uh, you guys. Um, it's very easy to get up and running as an institution with Hypothesis, and we have some special deals for for the fall. So it's definitely not too late to reach out to Education at Hypothesis and try to get um, a starter package going for for uh, for the fall at your institution. Uh, if your institution is a Hypothesis customer, and uh, if you're not a Hypothesis customer, this is the kind of wonderful uh, services that we provide. Um, we have a workshop program. Uh, Chrissy DeCarolis, our CSM, manages that. She's on the horn here. Um, we've got a great workshop series, back to school series with some sort of introduction to how to use it in your LMS, but then annotating your syllabus, a specific session on annotating your syllabus, and then a session on annotation starter assignments, which is, you know, we have some uh, you know, uh, assignments that you can borrow and use in your classes. And we also have a bank of uh, assignments that instructors like those on the, on the call today uh, have shared with us. So lots of uh, help to get started. And then another plug for another resource available to our customers, Hypothesis Academy. This is for whether you're new or experienced. I think anybody can find something uh, in our Hypothesis Academy courses, including the Hypothesis 101, sharing best practices with educators. It's a really amazing community to join. And then we do, uh, you know, Lisa have one that is focused on the age of AI and annotation in the age of AI and both ways to work against uh, chat GPT type things and also with chat GPT leveraging uh, social annotation. Um, with that, I want to give a big thank you uh, to our guests today. Uh, really wonderful conversation. I appreciate uh, some of you are new to Hypothesis, some of you have been around a long time, but I appreciate your thoughtful uh, engagement with the tool uh, and with us today. And I will just say, we're working on a number of different things to make instructional annotation easier, copying annotations from course to course, uh, feedback mechanisms in non-Canvas LMSs. So we're going to make your lives easier, but it, it takes it's hard work to do what you guys do. And you're really establishing your presence and you're really there for your students in a powerful way. So thanks for being such great teachers. Uh, as well. And thanks for your time today. Thanks, Jeremy. All right, folks, see you next time. See you. Thanks for the opportunity for to talk us. to great people. Yeah, thanks so much. Take care, folks. Bye. Bye.